£270 necklace. She needs to set boundaries. How does he not have a criminal record for that? This is considered stalking. Just invite English male strangers into their bed because accent. I guess so. You're going to have to bear with me. I just got a brand new camera. I have no idea if the audio is good. I may have to get a new mic. I may have to send this fucking thing back if it's shit. <laughs> Bear with me. Today I want to break down my criticisms of Love Actually. I wanted to do a Christmas related movie and I did a poll. I made so, like so many notes. I was trying to film this by the way whilst I was watching the movie but there was two problems with that. One, my cameras kept cutting out and two, it was taking forever to get through the movie. So I just figured I had to make a shitload of notes. So let's start with the actual beginning. Love actually starts off with an airport scene. It's really cute where it talks about, you know, love actually being all around and it has lots of families and loved ones all meeting each other. The only criticism I have around this piece is that the person narrating it is the Prime Minister. Well, the Prime Minister in the movie, anyway. That kind of annoyed me because people most disconnected from reality seems to be anyone in government right now. That just frustrated me as someone who's living through the current crisis in the UK. In some ways I get it, he's like the... he's meant to be like the voice of the people, I guess. I'm gonna break down each relationship rather than going scene by scene just so that it's more conclusive for each couple basically. I'm gonna start with the Prime Minister. I didn't realise he doesn't actually have a name. The credits literally just says the Prime Minister played by Hugh Grant. And then Natalie who is his love interest is played by Martine McCutcheon. After the narration the first scene that you see of the Prime Minister him turning up at 10 Downing Street and never really thought much of this until again this year with like some of the worst Prime Ministers we've probably ever had. The first thing he was asked was how are you or how are you feeling or something like that and his response was um cool powerful. If I'm honest that is exactly how politicians tend to think, like their role makes them more powerful than others. So if anything, that was actually probably quite apt. But again, just kind of rubbed me the wrong way that he's meant to be seen as a really good guy, even though he's a probably scummy politician. Because let's be honest, when the fuck did we ever get a good politician in 10 Downing Street? Then he's introduced to all of his staff, one of which is Natalie. She comes off as very charming because she ends up swearing in front of him. That was probably the normal things in their interactions. As he leaves to go to his study, he already has like a second look back at her, which kind of gives you the feeling of already this feeling between both of them, at least for him anyway. When he enters his study, he mutters to himself, well, that's inconvenient, as if to say, I'm clearly attracted to her. Which, consider I covered the Ned, the guy from the Try Guys, who got in trouble for one of the highest positions in the company and then having a relationship with someone of his junior. I went through all of this. It's sexual misconduct. You're not allowed to do that. Yes, it is convenient, but like you're an adult, just control yourself. The Prime Minister had a conference with a bunch of, I assume, other politicians in his cabinet. They were discussing the president's upcoming visit. He then has a discussion with Natalie. After the discussion, he says, You're the Prime Minister, for God's sake. So he is recognising that he needs to control himself around her because he clearly has some sort of attraction to her. And in another discussion, he asks where she lives and if she has a husband or boyfriend. She mentions that she used to have a boyfriend and that he wasn't a good guy. Now, this is one of the things I have a problem with around her character is that her character is consistently fat shamed by her ex-boyfriend, her dad has like a pet name for her, even the Prime Minister's assistant, whatever the fuck her title is, even she comments on this person's appearance and it just, where the fuck was that necessary? And maybe in your early 20s you may talk about people like that, I guess, at work. I honestly don't remember me ever doing that. Like, who the fuck in their 30s to 40s talks about people like that? It's just weird. Considering some of the other discussions that are had later down the line around LGBTQIA+, I thought that was just, a lot of it was just really unnecessary. It didn't need to be in there. It didn't need to be commented on. I don't know, to me it was just gross. So when the Prime Minister meets the US President, he is almost a few minutes into being inside 10 Downing Street, he meets Natalie and straight away after he's met her, again. Goodness, it's a pretty little son of a bitch right there. Did you see those pipes? Who talks like that? Especially with someone you don't know. There's very much a sexualization of her, which if that's your staff, that's like a prime minister and the president are having a discussion in the study. He goes to get some documents or something and he catches the president coming on to Natalie, very openly touching her and being inappropriate. Not long after this, there is a 
press conference and the president says that, you know, there's still a good relationship between the UK and the US. The Prime Minister stand up for Natalie. The president had soured their relationship. If I'm honest, I feel like that kind of humiliated the president because if one person's saying one thing and the other person ends up saying something completely different, I get why you did it. But if I'm honest, I don't think a Prime Minister would ever do that because you always agree what you're going to say before you say it, unless you're obviously being interviewed. But that these were like statements they were making. I just don't ever see that happening. I know it's like it's good for the film and it's morality and all this sort of stuff. I get why it happened. It's just, I don't see how that could ever happen because they're not allowed to do that. <laughs> to de-stress after that press conference, he has the infamous dance sequence. And it's funny because I always forget that that song in the movie is the actual, I assume, original, but it was covered by Girls Aloud. So whenever I see that dance, I automatically think of the Girls Aloud cover. I find it weird that that was like the promo song, but it was never actually used in the movie. <laughs> so the Prime Minister decides to redistribute Natalie. So it's unclear whether she was fired or just working elsewhere. So normally when you're redistributed, you are working for a different person. So that's probably what happened. It's very possible she got fired. <laughs> so he asked Annie, played by Nina Sosanya. I'm going to butcher a lot of names because I'm terrible at pronouncing shit. Uh, calls Natalie chubby with a sizable ass and huge thighs. Why were these comments fucking necessary? Just to push that she was slightly bigger than some of these skinny birds? Like, I don't get it. Again, why would assistants the Prime Minister feel like it was necessary to discuss the person's size? I just, I don't get it. I don't understand why that was necessary. Honestly, it was kind of like spiteful. The first time that Natalie is replaced, where he comes in with tea and biscuits for him, he clearly Really misses Natalie, some sort of forlorn look on his face. And then a few weeks later, he's reading Christmas cards and obviously he reads hers, has the forethought to go to talk to her and tell her how he feels. Again, I get why it's for the plot of the movie. It's really awkward for him to be having to knock on all these doors to try and find her actual address. But like, he couldn't have taken five minutes to maybe check in the star files what her fucking actual address was. He could have saved himself a lot of time. It was cute for the plot. He finally gets the right door and meets Natalie's family, one of which is her dad, who when he offers to drive her and the family to the school play. Her dad calls her Plumpy. I get that's a cutesier name for his daughter. Again, it's just very size orientated and considering all the other sort of comments, it just really pushes this narrative of Natalie or Martin McCutcheon was big when she fucking clearly wasn't. And not that it's okay to say that about anyone of any size anyway. So then they drive to the play and as they're getting out, there's actually a sweet moment where he admits that he doesn't want to go in because nobody wants a sleazy politician taking the limelight from the kids which i will agree 100 and he admits that he'll be sorry to see her leave she finds a way to get him in at the back of the school so that no one sees him and they end up having a very private kiss that becomes extremely public the last scene and criticism i have about their relationship is around the airport scene so there's all these cute moments where everyone from the story is meeting each other at the airport where it starts to where it finishes kind of thing she runs and jumps to hold him and he immediately says <laughs> Why was that necessary? I don't get it. There's some really nice moments in their whole like little story. I don't understand the fixation around this character's size. Like that's my one biggest gripe with this apart from the fact that sexual misconduct issue with him being the Prime Minister and her being part of his staff. Okay so now we have my favourite story which is between, there's my little breakdown, Karen, played by Emma Thompson, and Harry, played by Alan Rickman, also uh, Mia, played by Heike Macat. So we start with Alan Rickman, Harry, having a discussion with Mia, as she's new to the company and he wants to make sure that she's settling in okay. Uh, later on in the movie, he discusses the Christmas party and sh he asks if she has a boyfriend because people are allowed to take their spouses. And she says she doesn't have a boyfriend. I'd just be hanging around the mistletoe hoping to be kissed. So she's very clearly showing some sort of attraction to Harry. This is like a sort of increased by the fact that when Mia asks what are you gonna get me for Christmas, she is clearly trying to entice him by slightly spreading her legs. I don't like to talk about women like this in this like very sexual manner because I don't think women are just there to be sexualized. Even with her language she's saying about going in dark corners for doing dark deeds. She's very clearly 
trying to show some sort of attraction to him so that he's aware that she's into him. Then we see Karen, Emma Thompson, and Harry, and she's listening to Joni Mitchell, who she explains is basically the first love of her life, that she taught her how to love or feel. This becomes important later. So then at the Christmas party, Harry compliments Mia, saying that she's looking very pretty, and Mia admits that... Oh, I think that's very, very brazen considering his wife was a metres away, clearly in the same fucking room. Like, this isn't wife's away, the guy's gonna play sort of thing. This was, she was metres away and you're choosing to do this. It's not very smart. So when Harry and Karen get back from the Christmas party, Karen brings up Mia and warns him to be careful with that one, and especially because she asked very obviously. Mia's very pretty. You know she is, darling. When you haven't noticed if a girl's pretty, you're clearly hiding something. Like, if you can't admit to your partner, unless your partner is very easily, obviously, like, jealous, I feel like you can see people as attractive without being attracted to them. They may not be your type, or you may be so head over heels in love with someone else that you don't necessarily have attraction to someone you naturally normally would be because you're so in love with the other person. So then it cuts to Mia in her red dress and matching red underwear. I took one of two things from this. It was either that Mia was wearing matching underwear because she was expecting that someone may see them, or it's just because it matched the dress. Could be one or the other. Most of the time, I'm going to be honest, most women match their coloured underwear to the colour of their clothing if they're expecting someone else to see it. Especially red. It could just be because she was wearing a red dress and it was easier to not see her underwear. Just my opinion. Later on in the, I assume, week, Karen is laying in bed looking very worried. And to me, it seemed like... Because I couldn't see any bra straps on her. They could just have been sleeping naked. But... I was assuming that they'd just had sex and she felt vulnerable. So she was feeling vulnerable anyway due to the fact that her husband was clearly harboring some sort of attraction for someone who he works with, but also for the fact that she was naked in bed thinking about that, which makes you feel even more vulnerable. I don't know, it's just something I took. I thought that was a really good moment and it was very good acting because it was something very subtle that you wouldn't necessarily pick up otherwise. And then, so Harry's about to leave the office to go Christmas shopping and he says, see you later. And she's very clearly into him because she's saying, looking forward to it. Very much enunciating those words. So she also asks if he's going to get her a Christmas present. And then later on, before he meets up with his wife, he phones her up and asks what she needs. She asks for something she wants and she wants something pretty and he asks are you going to get me anything and she admits I thought it was obvious like you can have everything. Although again can we stop this like manager and junior member of staff sexual misconduct stuff. After she asks for something pretty he gets off the phone just just before his wife turns the corner and then we have my favourite scene in the whole movie. Would you like it gift wrapped? While Harry is looking at necklaces and his wife is getting a bunch of stuff for their mothers, he finds a necklace, 270 pound necklace that he wants to get for Mia. Just pause for two seconds, but he's spending 270 pounds on someone who isn't even his mistress yet. And what he gets for his wife, spoiler alert, is a lot less fucking expensive. Like, can we not? Later on in the week, I assume, Karen, his wife, finds the necklace in his pocket and is really clearly excited that he's bought her something special and not just scarves or socks. After it's wrapped up, it's exactly the same box size. It's pretty obvious to her that he must have bought this for her. So when it does come to the day of the school play, I assume Christmas Eve, but who the fuck does a school play on Christmas Eve? The saddest scene in the movie, which just... it always touches my heart and I know a lot of other people's. Karen picks the present that she's going to open. She opens it has a CD from Joni Mitchell. £270 necklace, CD. Like, what the fuck? So she goes upstairs to pull herself together and she's got the CD on in the background, crying and trying to keep herself together because she's got to keep it together for the kids, for their play. And it cuts to 
Mia putting on her necklace, which I think is very convenient. She's also putting it on on Christmas Eve and not Christmas Day, but sure. Something I didn't mention, but the Prime Minister is Aaron's brother, and therefore when she sees him at the school for the school play, she envelops him in a hug, and there's some clear, tight squeeze. The Prime Minister, Hugh Grant, it was a very genuine moment of, are you okay? Um, and her having to keep it together and not actually able to talk to her brother about something that was clearly hurting her. Again, I just, I thought that was a nice touch because it's something that would genuinely happen. Someone who hugs you tighter than normal or for a bit longer than normal. Having that kind of reaction is a very, very genuine thing. So then after the play, Karen confronts Harry about the necklace. To be honest, I think this is the most honest storyline of, of all of the stories. And she asks if it was just a necklace, if it was just sex in a necklace, or worst of all, love in a necklace. And honestly, I actually can't believe his reaction was... I am so in the wrong. A classic fool. Of course you're so in the fucking wrong. Did you expect her to disagree with you? <laughs> fuck was that response? The her, the acting of Emma Thompson. She's just an incredible actress. But she says, Yes, but you've, you've also made a fool out of me. You've made the life I lead foolish too. I think that was just so well said. So it's really sad to see that when, at the end, when Harry comes back from the airport, God knows where the hell he was, but when he comes back, it's Karen and the kids together and... How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Which makes me think, oh, maybe they'd divorced but actually straight afterwards Good to have you back. Come on. Um. sounds very deflated she's still just keeping it together for the kids i think that just shows that not every love story is ever going to be perfect which is one of the things i really liked about it. i didn't ha really have a lot of criticisms for that love story i thought it was the most accurate there is just a lot of tension when you know that even if he said that he's not going to cheat with this one it's very likely he's going to cheat with someone else and no i thought that one was the most accurate of any true love story i've had to move the camera over slightly because my battery was about to run out and i've had to <laughs> plug it in i've got like cables fucking everywhere so um, I'm gonna try and scoot through these a little bit faster because I've just spent the last 40 minutes talking about two out of like nine. The next one I want to talk about is Daniel, who is played by Liam Neeson, and Sam, who's played by Thomas Brody Sankster. We're introduced to Daniel because his wife has just died and he's about to go to her funeral. I think there's a, quite a touching moment where he talks about a conversation between his wife and him because she wants a certain song played. I said, over my dead body. And she said, no, Daniel, over mine. And it is quite a upbeat song, which is humorous for the movie, but it is something genuinely that a lot of people end up doing. They try to have some sort of more uplifting song. So it's like a, the funeral is actually a celebration of the person's life. So then there's a discussion between Daniel and Karen, Karen from the previous story, talking about his son, um, that he's worried about him. So he ends up having a discussion with his son. His son admits that he's in love with someone. So I think it's a very open-minded thing. And I think it's something that should be normalized and I, I appreciate that this happens a couple of times throughout the movie when the dad asks who it is in love with whether it's she or he I think that it's something very small but it normalises the fact that he didn't need to be heterosexual it was something very small to a lot of people probably very insignificant and especially as there's a yeah all of the relationships in this movie are completely heterosexual they have this nice moment of them watching Titanic which actually considering the extreme sad ending of that movie. I'm not sure if that was probably the best choice. His son later on has the epiphany to play the drums in the school play to make the person he's in love with fall in love with him. My criticism for this is he had like a week <laughs> before the school play, maybe two. Who the fuck learns how to play drums that quickly? Like, yes, he, he was playing constantly, but and it was probably pretty simplistic, but still, that's very unrealistic. <laughs> Just before the school play, they have another conversation and his son asks how his stepdad's love life is going. There was a moment at the funeral where he said that he, the only person he'd leave his wife for was Claudia Schiffer. I should bring Claudia Schiffer as my date. He again reiterates that he would never, there was no one ever better than your mother other than Claudia Schiffer. And then later on down the line, he actually meets someone who plays a character but is Claudia Schiffer. So I thought that was quite 
tying that up with a bow. The conversation he has with his son is a little weird, I'll be honest. Like, I appreciate it's said with a very dry, sarcastic tone. Like, don't be wrong, I love dry humour. But, like, admitting that if he had a relationship with Claudia Schiffer, he would be having sex everywhere with her, including in his room. I don't know, is that, could that not, like, traumatise your child? <laughs> At the school play, his son plays the drums, and singer who... Joanna, played by Olivia Olsen, she's singing this song, All I Want For Christmas Is You, and she ends up pointing directly at his son, which, honestly, was a little mean, considering she ends up pointing at loads of other people, and it's like, the first person you pick was the drummer. She's older than him, just something to keep in mind. But yeah, after the school play, the stepdad says, why don't you tell her how you feel, and tell her that you love her, and you'll always regret it if you don't, which I think, like, that is definitely something... You, I think having regrets is something you have like hard to live with so you know as long as you don't come off super fucking creepy while he's going to get his stuff he bumps into claudia schiffer then they rush to the airport he runs through security is chased by police how does he not have a criminal record for that <laughs> this was post 9 11 right like i know he's a kid but so sam then talks to joanna and admits his feeling joanna sam i thought you didn't know my name of course I do. So he ends up getting escorted back to his dad, the stepdad, and Joanna goes all the way back too, just to give him a kiss before she flies out to America. She was one of the last people due to get on the plane. She's delaying the plane to go give this little kid a kiss. Never gonna happen. So of course, right at the end, you have Claudia Schiffer, the stepdad, overlooking his stepson and Joanna as she comes back from America. Nice, happy ending for all of them. Okay, so this one's actually quite quick. We have Billy Mack is played by Bill Nye, and then Joe, the band manager, is played by Gregor Fisher. Right at the start, we have Bill Nye recording a cover and changing words for Christmas. I want to say the impeccable swearing in that first scene is chef's kiss. I used to quote it all the fucking time because I thought it was the best swearing I'd ever heard. Love is all a oh, fuck, wank, bugger, shitting, ass, head and hole. And to be honest, I thought he was quite a good singer. I will say one thing I got really confused by was that this was like four weeks before Christmas and he was just recording what he was going to put in for number one. It's not impossible to turn music around that quickly, but it's unlikely. So then he has a radio interview where he's actually extremely honest and blunt, which is honestly quite refreshing considering fucking no one is. And then there's a cameo by Ant and Deck, and he recommends to children to become a pop star because you get drugs for free. I know it's meant to be a joke, it's just drug addiction's not exactly funny considering what happened to Aaron recently. Drugs are a huge problem in the music industry, becomes the UK number one and leaves the party he's at to go to an Elton John party and then he ends up leaving that party to go back to his band manager because he's the love of his life. Guys, at Christmas is, is the time to be with the people you love. It might be that the people I love is in fact you. Which I thought was very sweet. I may not always love you. The next story is with Sarah. She works at the same company as Alan Rickman's Harry. She is played by Laura Linney. And you have Carl, who is her love interest, played by Rodrigo Santoro. I have a couple of criticisms, not necessarily about the story, just about her character. We're introduced to her quite late. Alan Rickman's Harry as her boss, which I think is kind of weird. And how long have you been in love with Carl? Two years, seven months, three days, and I suppose an hour and 30 minutes. So I just think that was odd. Like, really odd. I have no idea if that wasn't in focus the whole fucking time. I'm just gonna carry on as if that didn't happen. After she has this conversation with her boss, she has a phone call from her brother, which becomes really important later. She's working late and so is Carl. And when he leaves, she's elated after he says goodnight to her. And of course her phone immediately rings and it's her brother yet again. A couple of days later, I assume, her manager, Harry, and her are having this argument where they're like kind of smacking each other slightly uh, because they're just having a disagreement. And of course her phone rings and it's her brother yet again. This is a pattern which becomes important. At the Christmas party that Harry also was at, she's asked for a dance by Carl. When they go to the dance floor, there's like a quite fast track. Almost immediately, it changes from a fast song to a slow song, which can I just say, no fucking DJ ever does that. 
unless you're like a wedding DJ or some shit. I don't know any DJ that does that. They're seen dancing and then they go back to her place. So something I find really fucking weird about this interaction is that, yes, I appreciate that. I think they've worked together for so many years or whatever and she's always been in love with him. But this is the first time they've actually had some sort of, clearly they're both into each other, have been into each other realization they have this really passionate kiss she invites him in then invites him upstairs and then they're like half naked almost immediately so i get this is probably for the duration of the movie it's already like a two hour 15 minute movie or whatever but it had me questioning considering i don't see you going straight from a passionate kiss to being half naked maybe you come in, you have a drink, have some discussions, then you get hot and heavy on the sofa, then you may move upstairs. Maybe that's just me. I found that way, way, way too fast, but it was probably just for the duration of the movie. I get it. So they're half naked and she gets a phone call, a course from her brother. He asks if she can talk or something along those lines and she says immediately, I'm not busy. So that tells Carl that she's always going to put her brother before him, which I get it, family, 100%, but none of these calls are life-threatening. He is being kept at a facility where, you know, he's being taken care of. My problem with her is she needs to set boundaries and she cannot be frustrated with herself or her life if she is the one who is not setting those boundaries with her brother because she is causing him to be codependent to call her. So Carl comes across very understanding when she gets off the phone and says that it's full of interruptions and complications and they get hot and heavy again and of course she gets a phone call again and he asks would it make him better and she admits no and of course he said well then maybe don't answer it because it's the thing if she wants to have a relationship and look after her brother she needs to set those boundaries maybe not right that second but that's something she should think about it was even more awkward that they kept the take where she accidentally like knocks carl in the face with her elbow i know that was clearly like accidental from the actress but it was just sort of rubbing salt in the wound considering that was the second time she'd taken a phone call over him and she agrees to leave to go look after her brother when she does go to her brother she and this is another day it was daylight hours kind of thing her brother in, in a bad way and tries to hit her but is almost immediately apologetic. On Christmas Eve, the last time we see Carl and Sarah interact is when they're working late. He says Merry Christmas and walks out the door away from her. Immediately afterwards, she finds her brother and goes over to spend Christmas Eve with him. My biggest gripe with their story is the fact that her life could be different if she just set better boundaries, better restrictions, limits. Like, she can't be there 24-7 for her brother. That's why she has him at a centre where he can be cared for like that. She could do more for herself and for her life and to be happier rather than making her brother codependent on her. Now we have Mark, Juliet and Peter. So Mark is played by Andrew Lincoln, aka The Walking Dead's Rick. And then we have Juliet, who's played by Kira Knightley, and Peter, who's played by Chiwetel Ejiofor. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. We introduce this couple as Peter is being married to Juliet. So the only thing I find like a little uncomfortable about this oh sorry sweetie about this movie is the fact that Kira Knightley I'm pretty sure was 17 at the time of filming this video so I'm pretty sure she was also 17 at the time of filming Pirates of the Caribbean I don't know I just feel kind of weird having a 17 year old getting married I appreciate her character obviously wasn't gonna be 17 I don't know it's just like did, did they need to hire someone who was 17 to marry someone who was like gonna be 12 years older than her and even the other love interests Andrew Lincoln's character Mark they're both probably about the same age they could have picked any other actress like she's a great actress i love her in loads and loads of movies i think she's great but i just don't think it was necessary to have a 17 year old play this character that's all so then they're surprised with choir with lots of instruments i assume newly husband's favorite singer i didn't recognize him he was chuffed a bit the only thing i don't like about that that scene is is mark high-fiving the vicar it just came off so cringe. So at the reception, Mark is recording consistently. He's looking lovingly, adoringly at the couple and is asked by Sarah, the person in the previous story, if he was gay because he was clearly looking at that person lovingly, adoringly. And again, I think this just normalises not immediately her thinking, oh, he must be attracted to the bride, normalised LGBTQIA+. There's also a lot of normalisation of sex and people's bodies. I, 
forgot to mention in the previous story, Sarah and Kyle were getting very hot and heavy. There was nipples shown and, and in this story as well, they have the art gallery, which has nipples and butts all over the place, which just normalises people's sexuality and human bodies at the end of the day. So this is when he's asked by Juliet if she could have a look at the videos that he filmed the day of the wedding, because theirs was fucked. She eventually turns up at his flat, which one small thing not criticism, just a like behind the scenes thing. There was a story behind the hat. Do you know why the hat was there? Tell me. I had a massive spot in the middle of my forehead. This is the problem with being 17 and being in films. I mean, and it was humongous. So there was no choice, but we had to find a hat to cover it because there was no lighting, there was no makeup that was going to cover it. I will never look at that hat the same way again. So anyway, Mark was to be obsessively filming Juliet. Even though they'd never spoken to each other, he was clearly in love with her. It genuinely confuses me in that respect because she says, you never talk to me. So how can you be in love with someone just by their appearance? I mean, maybe it was the way she was interacting with other people, but I just can't see it. How are you fully in love with someone if you, you don't interact with them? I just find that really, really odd. That All that does is speak to, she's a beautiful object. And maybe that's because he works in an art gallery or something, I don't fucking know, but I didn't like that. So when he eventually leaves, cringy moment where he shouts, there's a guy about to walk past. It just made me seriously cringe. But one thing I noticed as someone who now owns their own place, like I noticed him only been walking for a minute or two and he was immediately on the south bank. Dude, if you can afford a fucking place on the South Bank, you must be minted. He works at an art gallery. How does he have that much money? <laughs> I guess commissions or something, but bloody hell. So then he turns up at Juliet and Mark's door with the cards. Something that I saw in a TikTok recently, which is so true, is what would have happened if Mark had answered the door instead of Juliet? Like, this scene would have been really fucking awkward. <laughs> he says he has no agenda by telling her this, which I think is good, considering she literally just got fucking married to his best mate. At Christmas, you tell the Drew. Disagree, I think you tend to keep the peace. So he says, you are perfect, which I think is kind of intense. And his wasted heart will always love you until you look like this. Again, it's very much about looks. So he clearly has some sort of obsession over the way she looked and not the person who she was. I don't particularly find that very fucking romantic, personally. As he walks away, she comes out and kisses him on the mouth. After she goes back, he mutters... Enough. Enough now. I understand why she might have thought giving him a kiss on Christmas Eve, I want to say, was a good idea and it was sweet and it was kind, but actually all that would do in actual fact is intensify someone's obsession over you. And I don't think that would have been fair to him either because it's just leading him on. The last time we see them is them turning up at the airport. I can't remember who they met, but yeah, so it was Peter and Juliet meeting someone and Mark third wheeling, what a fucking surprise. So I don't think he was gonna get over that crush anytime soon, was he? We're close to being done. Okay, so the seventh story is John and Just Judy. These two are co-workers and they are uh, body doubles for someone in a movie. They are played by Martin Freeman and Joanna Page. So there's multiple scenes of them which I questioned a little bit because I get, again, it's for, the, it's for the movie, it has to all be spread out and everything. If this was taken as per the, the way all the other stories are going, their scenes were done over weeks and I just don't think that happens from my understanding. If you're going to do a sex scene, you tend to do it over over max of like a couple of days unless they need to do reshoots I guess. They had the body doubles in and one of the comments as well was that they were going to get in the one of the other actors were due to come in so they were trying to rush them and I don't know it just would you not just have the actors come like a different day? Maybe they only had that place hired for such a long time only so many hours a day or something I don't fucking know. But anyway so again I feel like this very much normalised nipples you know there was, there was a lot of breasts shown sex obviously their storyline is just really cute he ends up asking her out on a date they go on a date and all I want for Christmas is you. I don't think there's anything to criticise about theirs except for how the movie was apparently being shot, to be honest. They end up again at the airport, clearly engaged to her and... <laughs> Might get a shag at last. Actually, yeah, they got engaged in like 
a month. Fucking hell, that was, that was really quick. Second to last is Jamie and Aurelia. So Jamie is played by Colin Firth and Aurelia is played by Lucia Moniz. So it starts with Jamie and he is really intense with his wife, uh, sorry, his girlfriend. Uh, she's not feeling well and he's very much love bombing her at the start. He comes back after the wedding between the wedding and the reception to see how she's doing because he's that much of a love rat and finds that she's cheating on him with his brother fucking hate people like that but i will say him love bombing her like does tend to push people away not necessarily into a bed with somebody else so he ends up at a cabin i guess in france he's introduced to aurelia and drives her home every night he's trying to make conversation with her but obviously neither of them speak each other's languages she doesn't speak really any english he doesn't really speak any portuguese if any they're kind of talking but in both of the languages and again there was some sort of like fat comments which I wasn't that cool with. He ends up writing outside later on in the day I guess. For some reason he has his whole manuscript outside so that when she's cleaning up the pages flutter over and into the lake and they go into the lake to try and get all the pages. Who the fuck takes the whole manuscript outside? Would you not maybe have a few of the pages that you were working on or whatever unless you had been sat out there for hours and done that much by fucking doubt it but obviously it creates this cute moment where she jumps in the lake he jumps in the lake it's very like i feel like a nod to mark darcy and then they're talking even though they have this language barrier in some ways still talking the same language they say goodbye and she gives him a kiss and he clearly can't stop thinking about it so is learning portuguese which by the way shout out canary wolf where i work he's coming down some escalators where he's got headset on he's got like christmas shopping or something it's clearly canary wolf station i never clocked it before on christmas eve jamie turns up at his family's and he's got bags of presents and within seconds he's handing the presents over and leaving the funny thing i find about this is the fact that the kids say i hate uncle jamie but they got presents with no interaction like is that not goals <laughs> so then jamie arrives in i want to say portugal because he's talking portuguese with her parents so before they walk all the way to uh, aurelia's work there is some conversation around the wrong sister and that he would pay to get rid of her or whatever which is really fucking weird like can we not normalize that sort of stuff of portuguese people they also leave their door like the front door wide open which what and he also again there's like fat comments he calls his daughter miss dunkin donuts 2003 which also we didn't have dunkin donuts in europe i'm pretty sure in 2003 again can we stop fat shaming people in movies i would love that so there is a very incredibly romantic moment where jamie arrives at the restaurant and asks uh, Aurelia to marry him. Yes, this being my answer. <laughs> Easy question. One thing though is about these kind of declarations of love. Like I have the exact same problem with the notebook unfortunately. This is considered stalking. It's just as well she was into it. Again, can we not normalize stalking? <laughs> Jamie and Aurelia are at the airport coming back from Portugal and that's where Peter, Julia and Mark were picking them up. Jamie's friends are so good looking. He never tells me this. <laughs> I think maybe now I have made the wrong choice, picked the wrong Englishman. Can't speak English properly. Lastly, this is my least favourite and I'm going to try and rip this one apart because I genuinely don't like this story. This is about the character Colin Frizzle and his friend Tony. So Colin Frizzle is played by Chris Marshall and Tony is played by Abdul Salis. Colin is introduced to us when he turns up at the office where a lot of these guys work. So that's Harry, Mia, uh, Sarah, Paul. He's like a food delivery. He seems to do a lot of odd job sort of things, giving food to people. And there's actually some like sexual harassment kind of language that's used, which again, I just, I don't like this sort of shit normalized. Like try my nuts, beautiful muffin for a beautiful lady, morning future wife. This is sexual harassment. The literal definition is sexual harassment. He's then working at the wedding reception for Juliet and Peter. And he's trying to come onto a woman and ends up insulting her because he's insulting the food. And so he, and he finds his friend Tony sitting down reading a magazine. So, okay, I've worked weddings. I've worked catering for weddings, especially when they've clearly just arrived. They've got the canapes out at the time. You don't have time to sit down. But anyway, so they're sitting down, chatting or whatever. He ends up insulting British women because they're stuck up because they don't want to have sex with him. And I will say his friend does give it to him straight saying that he's lonely, ugly and an asshole. And I would say he's definitely an asshole, like his character. And he calls himself the god of sex. It's just that he's on the wrong continent. Someone has a fucking ego. He decides that he's 
going to Wisconsin and that there's going to be 10 women in any bar that's more beautiful than any British woman basically and they'd all want him because of his accent which is from Basildon Essex by the way which is up the road from me <laughs> or at least where I live now that's not where I'm from I have a heart of a cheer accent believe it or not sometimes it must have taken him to the airport and here comes Colin Frizzle and he's got a big knob right in front of security like can we like what is this of course because it like there's a flight going to america there has to be some sort of american with a cowboy hat like do we have to stereotype americans like that <sighs> so yeah so he turns up in wisconsin and asks to go to any single bar which by the way you ask any cab driver to go to any bar they're just going to take you to probably the closest one so he's basically just still right by the airport, is my assumption anyway. So he turns up at a bar and he meets two very model-esque women immediately. So they invite a complete stranger to stay with them, that they've got no PJs, and that Harriet, the sexy one, that's literally what they call her, and they end up all falling into bed together. Which, I don't know, I, I feel like they're really doing a disservice to American women in this way. Like, they're trying to make out like, oh... Or model-esque sort of women will just invite English male strangers into their bed because accent? What, what do you call that? Uh, bottle. Bottle? <laughs> what about this? Uh, straw. Straw! <laughs> like, what? So anyway, he ends up turning up at the airport with Harriet. He also brought Carla from America so that she can meet Abdul and immediately starts making out with him because accent. Hello, you must be Tony. Oh, you are gorgeous. <laughs> that feels very, very Andrew Tate-esque to me. Like, Andrew Tate before it's time. Gross. In conclusion, the movie is not bad. There are, like, a lot of nice moments. Even the sad moments. The acting's really, really great. There is a lot of stuff that is not bad with the movie, don't get me wrong, but there are just things, like, little things that just... Especially that last story, I just don't think that needed to be in there. I just felt like it was unnecessary. That wasn't about love, that was about lust. That was just about sex. So, it wasn't love. Actually. <laughs> Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give this a like and subscribe if you feel like it. I'd really appreciate it. Let me know what you think of the microphone setup. I've only just got this today, so I'm going to play around with the camera more, the settings more. I feel like I'm super, super washed out. I'm pretty sure it wasn't focused for a little bit there. I apologise. Brand new camera. I need to get used to it. I apologise. But And if you want me to do this on any other movies, I can maybe do it for New Year's Eve. Let me know if that's something you'd want to see in a comment below. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Bye!